and, and unbridled support for it by the United States and by other Western governments if the United States did not give Israel the green light, did not guarantee Israel its military support, its financial support, our tax dollars, and its political support by ensuring Israel that it will veto Well, Hawaita, uh, welcome to Fort Wayne uh, and Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. Thank you. We're just uh, we're delighted to have you, although these are very dire, dire days, and our hearts are heavy, and there's a shadow cast uh, over over our time together this weekend. Uh, uh, you're here for our evening of lament and solidarity, supporting Gaza. So thank you. Thank you for having me and for your solidarity and everything you do to raise your voice at this time because it's needed now more than ever. Uh, as, as we sit here today, and I know uh, you'd be there if you weren't here with us, uh, hundreds of thousands uh, uh, are gathering in Washington, D.C. Uh, to demonstrate. Uh, talk to us about the importance of this March on Washington uh, today. Yes, I would pro definitely be there if I was not here today, but um, I, I have a lot of friends there and uh, longtime colleagues who have organized this march, and I realize also the importance of being in places where people cannot get to Washington, D.C. So there was a call for as many people as can get to Washington, D.C. as possible, but also if you can't go to continue with efforts uh, around the country and really around the world. The importance of it is to show widespread rejection of not only what Israel is doing and the, the horrific barbaric actions that it has been taking that has cost already thousands, thousands, it's estimated that this weekend it will be over 10,000 Palestinian lives in less than a month and so it's not only that but it is the blatant and, and unbridled support for it by the United States and by other Western governments if the United States did not give Israel the green light, did not guarantee Israel its military support, its financial support, our tax dollars, and its political support by ensuring Israel that it will veto UN Security Council resolutions calling for a ceasefire or that would mandate that action be taken to enforce a, a ceasefire, then Israel would not be able to commit the atrocities that we are now seeing, atrocities that literally fit the textbook definition of genocide. So we are witnessing a genocide. We are seeing it on our phones. We are hearing it from the statements of Israeli leaders. And our administration in the United States here are gaslighting us here in, and, and helping to spread Israel's false propaganda that this is just about getting Hamas uh, and that's a separate topic. It is not about Hamas. It is about Israel's continued war on the entire Palestinian people. But while they are doing that, it is important to show the American people's rejection of you, the United States' shameful support of a genocide. Yeah. And a genocide being just the latest phase in Israel's settler colonial expansion that Palestinians have been uh, attempting to, to withstand and to survive for nearly eight decades now. What are you hearing uh, from your friends? Uh, I know it's hard to get information out of Gaza, but what are you hearing from your friends either in Gaza or in the West Bank in Palestine? Well, the situation is, is unbelievable. Um, many are don't have the luxury of too much communication because Israel has cut off electricity and has cut off fuel. And so people have been using um, whatever left of car batteries to charge phones. Uh, so communication is difficult, but there are ways that information is 
coming out of Gaza. I have not been personally calling or taking up that space, but trying to take whatever information is coming out and, and disseminate that as much as possible. In the West Bank, things are also horrifying, but people in the West Bank don't, are, are, are almost themselves saying that it is really bad here, but the situation, the focus should be on Gaza now. And when I say really bad, people are being rounded up and abused and tortured. Villages are being uh, depopulated. Settlers are terrorizing uh, villagers. They have done just some sick actions. For example, placing bloody dolls at the doorstep of Palestinian schools, like elementary schools, to further terrorize them, coming into villages and, and bounding and beating up the men in the village and then giving villages 24 hours to evacuate or be killed. And Palestinians know very well that the settlers will kill them and there will be no accountability because it is the Israeli government that has given the settlers these weapons and it is the Israeli government that has really annou announced an intention to gain control over, well, they already control, but to depopulate these villages and these areas of the Palestinian population. You know, I heard this uh, from three different West Bankers in the last, I guess, 10 days to two weeks. Uh, we interviewed uh, Eamon Shaka from Nablus, one of our mission partners. Diana has, when, when she had to cancel, and then a friend of mine in Bethlehem, they said, the population transfer, of course, that's a euphemism, right, for ethnic cleansing. But the, or you call it depopulation, but the population transfer that's happening in Gaza uh, is happening in spades in the West Bank too, and that's not getting much press. And so this mass transfer, this ethnic cleansing, is really happening throughout the entire, from the river to the sea, as they say, right? And so, I mean, what's happening in Gaza is a precursor, or it's, it's parallel what's happening in the West Bank. This is an agenda, this is a 75-year agenda, really, that's coming to fruition now. Plan Dalit back in the 40s, now uh, a continuation now in the 2020s. You know, that's, uh, I agree with that, and we have to take a broader view of what's happening, because while there is this um, kind of horrific and systematic uh, killing of civilians in Gaza and destroying their ability to live that is playing out on our phones, really, because the mainstream media doesn't show you much of it. It is part of a broader plan. As I said, Israel is a settler colonial project. And settler colonialism, the intent or the end goal is really replacing the indigenous population and that has been happening uh, in, in various forms and with various policies over the decades to squeeze Palestinians into smaller and smaller areas of land uh, so we could take over the land with just fewer Palestinians and, and, and populate this land with Jewish Israelis and over the years we have seen many uh, of Israel's policies intended to do that, from the building of the wall to, you know, restrictions on movement, making it impossible to even make a living unless you think about leaving into these areas where Israel is letting, allowing you to live. And then these killings and these uh, mass arrests, making people think about, can I leave? Is it possible to leave? Because Israel has made life so impossible uh, that people will look at the future, the future of their children is what kind of future do I have or maybe I should think about leaving. So it is these calculations that Israel has imposed on the Palestinian people. And, you know, with this, although it has been happening for decades, it has been accelerated in a sense with this fascist right-wing Israeli government that has given really a, a green light to its settlers, arming them. And uh, so we've heard over the past few months of these pogroms, these attacks on Palestinian villages, these killings, these burnings of fields that have been happening, uh, again, over the years, but not in such an accelerated fashion as we have seen over the last year with declared intentions of Israeli leaders that villages <coughs> should be wiped off the map. 
Palestinians should be uh, eradicated. And, you know, we have, I, I personally was thinking before, you know, we know that this is Israel's plan, but they can't come and whole scale deport people and buses out of the territory. Like there would be, a, the world would say something, there would be an uprising about it. But now what we're seeing in Gaza, like a genocide and talks about if there are civilians left, we'll move them into the Sinai if these forced population transfers. The world's not, the world's not being silent, but they're supporting Israel. But they're <laughs> actively, and not the world really, because we no, see the right. millions around the world, tens of millions rising up, but the Western yeah. powers that have That's right. so hijacked the meaning of international world order and international law, international humanitarian law, to allow Israel to do what it's doing, it is it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. No, I'm glad you made that distinction because the governments are one thing, but the people, I mean, it, it's a hell of a thing to say, but, but uh, you, you find more and more and more tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people around the world rising up in support of the Palestinians, finally, finally. Um, yes, and they have been, you know, over the years, the issue is, can mass people power affect their governments, uh, affect the policy of their governments? And we have to believe that we can, right? We have to believe that we can. We just have to keep educating, getting more people to know, because we are up against a large propaganda machine that is very well financed and we've seen with US officials horrifically there is no shame um, they are shamelessly participating in Israeli propaganda we will never forget that you know President Joe Biden lied to such an extent that you know his team had to walk back what he said in terms of seeing evidence of beheaded babies that don't exist, you know, that don't exist, but knowingly uh, lying or putting yourself at the service of you know, this mass propaganda that is intended to dehumanize Palestinians and to desensitize the world to the, the mass atrocities that Israel is now committing is, is atrocious, it's unforgivable. Yeah. Well, I want to... Yeah, I mean, you and I are in our group here. We're fellow travelers on this road of justice and Palestinian liberation and support. Um, but I want to give you a, a chance because I know people are, still have questions. I mean, anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism, and yet that is the charge that's thrown around for anybody having any kind of peaceful demonstration or saying any possible thing that, about a ceasefire because of this propaganda machine you talk about. Having said that, anti-Semitism is a real thing. And there have been uh, some folks who have been part of the movement who have committed some anti-Semitic acts and statements and all the rest. I want to just give you an opportunity to say a word about anti-Semitism and uh, um, uh, the, the charge that's made to people in our movement. Absolutely, thank you for that. Uh, I agree wholeheartedly. Anti-Semitism is a real problem, but it is not the Palestine liberation movement that is anti-Semitic. And we are conscious of the fact that some might try to use our cause to, you know, further their anti-Semitic agenda. And over a decade ago, the Palestinian activist voices put out a statement rejecting any form of anti-Semitism as a part of our movement. And we are, uh, whenever we see it, we denounce it because fighting against the dehumanization of Palestinians, fighting for Palestinian liberation is also fighting against all forms of racism and discrimination. And anti-Semitism is certainly one of them. So the Palestinian liberation movement, um, we are allies in the struggle for the fight against uh, anti-Semitism. But those who like to blur the lines, who deliberately 
blur the lines, who weaponize anti-Semitism in order to protect Israel, they are the ones who are doing a great disservice to the real fight against anti-Semitism. Again, because ours is a struggle against all forms of racism and discrimination, and those who are really concerned about anti-Semitism should line up with us because our call is like, is what I said again, a, a broad call for freedom, human rights, dignity, respect for all people, regardless of race, religion, ethnicity, and therefore there is no room for any kind of discrimination in our movement. But again, weaponizing anti-Semitism is intended to silence and to scare people into silence. So silencing by trying to say those people who are calling for a ceasefire or free Palestine are just anti-Semitic, don't pay attention to them or vilify them or punish them. And to scare others who might speak out into not saying anything because they don't want to be labeled as anti-Semites. So it is all part of a silencing tactic that is intended to allow Israel to commit the crimes that it continues to commit. Uh, and therefore all of these efforts should be widely condemned, realized for what they are, and rejected. Uh, and I think that more people are aware of that, of the uh, purpose of weaponizing anti-Semitism. The loudest voices against that have been Jews themselves, uh, organizations like Jewish Voice for Peace, or if not now, not in our name. These are all Jews saying that the, criticizing the policies of the State of Israel is not anti-Semitic, and in fact, it is a duty for us to do, and it is anti-Semitic to suggest that all Jews are would support the policies of the state. Say of a word about the recent uh, protests that you were part of with those Jewish groups at the Capitol. Yes, uh, before that protest, myself and uh, two others, a, a Jewish woman from Jewish Voice for Peace, disrupted a, a Senate Foreign Relations Committee hearing to um, further the uh, nomination or the um, appointment of a uh, ambassador to Israel. And we disrupted it, calling on these senators to call for a ceasefire. The first nine, ten minutes of the hearing was all about Israel and, and Israeli victims, not one word about Palestinian victims, Palestinian rights, and this was only a day after Israel had bombed a hospital, Al Ahli hospital in Gaza, killing almost 500 people. Not one word of concern about Palestinian lives lost. And so three of us separately stood up and called for a ceasefire. I specifically called on the senators to recognize that they have an obligation to prevent genocide. We are signatory to the Convention on the Prevention and Prosecution of genocide, the crime of genocide. So part of that obligation is not only punishing after the fact, but it is to intervene to prevent uh, a genocide. And earlier that week, a, a letter signed by nearly 900 international lawyers and legal scholars and genocide scholars had put out a, a letter of concern saying what we are seeing fits the definition of genocide and states have an obligation to to intervene to prevent this. Um, and not only are we seeing none of that intervention, we are seeing zero concern. Yeah. So we were arrested, uh, those three of us that disrupted the meeting, but after we were processed and then released, we went right to the Capitol where we met up with um, hundreds of Jewish activists who took over the rotunda of the Canton and House office building in a very powerful action. All of them we are wearing shirts and carrying signs saying not in our name. Um, and and never again is now. Never again includes you know, Palestinians. And they managed to uh, maintain you know the, that uh, occupation of the rotunda for nearly four hours because they were um, about 350 uh, of them including dozens of rabbis, 
uh, who were leading actually the chants and the songs. Mm -hmm. And it took almost four hours for DC police to bring enough uh, police officers to arrest them and, and carry them out. But it, uh, and the following week, we saw also hundreds take over the Grand Central Station yeah. in New York. These are powerful actions that not only you know, raise a voice and, uh, and alert people who might not be following us to what's happening, but importantly, show, say that it's Jews also saying no. They're saying, don't use us, don't weaponize our grief, don't weaponize anti-Semitism for your murderous agenda. And it is really un unfortunate and sad that despite these powerful voices, despite the, the countless Jews who are speaking up and saying not in our name, that people still, people still say to oppose Israel's actions or to criticize Israel is anti-Semitism. In fact, a, an Israeli spokesperson just yesterday um, sent something out about social media on social media saying that he regrets having to do this but it has come time to say that these Jews who are he said side siding with those who kill Jews but what he meant are those calling for a ceasefire those calling for an end to yeah. Israel's brutal policies they can no longer be considered part of the Jewish people like it is that obnoxious yeah this uh, propaganda machine that you've been talking about I mean, we know we know it's powerful I'm not even sure we know how powerful I mean it, it seeps into the consciousness uh, even unconsciously in people I often use the example settler in our vocabulary in America is a positive term you know it's taught in history books for social studies books for kids in grade schools I mean it's it just seeps in everywhere, this sort of propaganda uh, uh, language. Uh, and, and so what we're finding now in these days, cancellation is taking place. I was going to be at the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights in Houston, canceled by the Hilton. Uh, CARE, a meeting, where was the CARE meeting? Was that in Chicago? Uh, in Arlington, canceled. American Muslims for Palestine, Chicago, canceled. Uh, Nathan Thrall's book tour, A Third of the Stops, canceled. Um, uh, 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 Arab America, celebrating empowerment of Arab Americans, canceled. And I'm just touching the tip of the iceberg. Talk about, uh, talk about the cancellations and what we need to do, I mean, how we need to redouble our efforts. Yes, on top of the just horrors that we are witnessing coming out of Gaza, we are seeing in the United States and around the world um, a concerted effort to penalize those and, and again to silence those who are speaking up against genocide. Who are I speaking. Didn't even, I'm sorry, I didn't even mention people losing their jobs because they post exactly. about a ceasefire on Facebook. Exactly. I mean, the simplest humane kinds of I mean, simple posting. I mean, they're losing their jobs, losing customers. I mean, it's it's everywhere. Yep, it is everywhere, and it's it's horrifying. It's almost as if we're in some kind of twilight zone. My nine-year-old daughter says, tries to rationalize and make me feel better when she sees just how upset I am over these you know cases coming in where you're you're calling for humanity. You're calling for people to re respect. Palestinian lives to show outrage over the killing of not even all Palestinians ideally it would be but but 4,000 Palestinian children who are killed and buried under rubble and they torn to bits and all you hear is but Hamas is all Hamas there is no empathy and so the the smallest actions of uh, trying to show empathy, calling for a ceasefire, is resulting in these, um, this backlash that you, uh, you, know, you talked about. And so, obviously, I am, even at home, uh, being very, getting very upset about this. And so my nine-year-old says, Mama, their head is just in another dimension. And I 
Like maybe that's true because you can't explain how it's hard to put words to this um, to what we're living right now where opposing genocide makes you the bad guy, right? <laughs> Uh, we have a legal organization <coughs> in the United States, Palestine Legal, which was founded about 14 years ago, to defend those who are uh, punished, penalized, silenced for speaking up for Palestinian rights. And they get on average of about 200 or so cases a year that they work on. In, the, in three weeks, they had over 400 cases of people anywhere from you know efforts to shut down their organizations to being fired from their jobs for opposing a genocide and that is certainly scary it is horrific to think that these are the times that we are living in now it might make someone question their faith in the essential goodness of people i try not to let that happen to me because it's uh, it's hard to continue if you can't really believe that people are essentially good they're just misinformed and so we have to keep on with the with trying to inform people as scary as that is when your job or something else like that is on the line i can only say that we have to keep on and recognize that there is a force there is a power in numbers and palestine legal did put out a call for attorneys and legal organizations to help because they are a small organization. There are only six attorneys uh, working there and and dozens and dozens of attorneys, myself included, said that we will commit pro bono hours, whatever, to advise and to help people and to fight. So there are resources to help people to fight this. And we have to fight this because if we don't, then otherwise we're just accepting uh, being silenced and we can't be silent at this time. Well, we're we're four weeks into this most recent. I, I don't want to I don't want to put you know October seventh as a demarcation time because this has been going on right. For, but this ramping up of this assault on Gaza, uh, this latest assault on Gaza. Uh, um, so we're four weeks into this. You're one of the leaders, really, uh, uh, within a, a large movement of Palestinians in this country and around the world, but I'm talking about not the United States now, and other fellow travelers with our Palestinian friends leading the way. Where does the movement head from here? Uh, give us our marching orders. Well, I don't know if I can give any marching orders, <laughs> but if I can provide any kind of, of guidance. Um, right now, the most urgent thing is to continue pressing for an immediate ceasefire. And that entails calling uh, and writing, but calling is kind of the most direct and effective your elected members of Congress and the White House to demand an immediate ceasefire. We just need to, and we have been flooding their phones. Um, there have been actions occupying offices. Uh, we are planning similar in Detroit, but they have been kind of across the country, occupying senators and, and Congress people's offices saying you have to demand a ceasefire now because the most immediate is trying to save lives. And every day, hundreds of lives are being lost. Every 10 minutes, Israel kills another child. Every yeah. 10 minutes for a month. I mentioned that tonight, yeah. Yeah. and we have to stop the slaughter. But after that, you know, we know that's not enough. We know that this kind of killing, uh, this violence will not end as long as the system that enables it remains in place. And that is a system of, of settler colonialism, which is inherently violent. Colonialism has been declared by the world community as a crime against humanity as is apartheid, which Israel is also imposing, as has been exposed by at least three human rights, huge human rights organizations. Israel's largest human rights organization, Betzela, along with the two leading human rights organizations in the world, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, all of them with um, 200 plus page 
factual and legal uh, report and analysis about how Israel is committing the crime of apartheid and persecution, and these are crimes against humanity. So we have to continue educating and insisting that our governments here in the United States, the United States government, get behind immediate decolonization and freedom for the Palestinian people. Um, there is, I mean, that is really a, the solution. And so my marching orders, if, if you will, is right now to please every single day call until there is, and demand a ceasefire until there is one. Along with that is pushing for as much humanitarian aid to get in as possible because that is about immediately saving lives, though the issue of Palestine is not a humanitarian one. It's not one about humanitarian aid, right? Because although what is happening in Gaza now has been declared uh, by the UN as a hu humanitarian catastrophe, it is not you know, a natural catastrophe. It is a man-made political one that is not um, cured or rectified by humanitarian aid. It is by ensuring that you know, the, the deliberate policies uh, creating this catastrophe are ended. Uh, so we must continue after that to continue our education and speaking out. And part of that is also amongst each other. You know, when we educate, when we try to put out information for people there to learn more, then we need the action. We always hope that the education leads to action. And action because it is the you know politicians who make policies, we have to make sure that the politicians are doing the work that represent our values and that represent the the, the, the right policies um, that will represent our our rhetoric. We hear you know there's in, in America for sure. There is rhetoric, and then there is our actions, and they do not. <laughs> um, Never the twain shall meet. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, um, part of that is is continuing to communicate with our elected representatives, and if they don't do what they need to do in terms of policies that actually respect life, and uh, then we run other candidates, we run ourselves, you know, for different offices you know, from the top level down to the very local because it also starts very local in terms of the the education and what is put out on a very local level and i think so getting more involved in that political process and supporting candidates who represent kind of our values and the policies that we want to see uh is very important you know people uh I want to say thanks for your bold and courageous witness. Truly, uh, people ask me, you know, you know, we want we want solutions here in the U.S. You know, quick. And so they say, well, where do you, where do we find hope? And I say, well, we find hope in the resilience of our Palestinian friends. We find hope in in voices of conscience of people of goodwill, Jewish Jewish voices of conscience. And uh, I find hope, too, because we're in this together. None of us are in this alone. And uh, we're grateful to you for uh, as a compelling and poignant and inspirational voice. So thank you, Holly, for being with us thank this you. weekend. We are definitely in this together, and we need every single one of us. Thank you.